Howard. Good evening. In the third of our interviews with the leaders of the big three parties in British politics tonight, we're talking here in London Docklands to Michael Howard of the Conservatives. The Tories have been out of power since they went down to that crashing defeat eight years ago. Are we going to be willing to bring them back on May the 5th? Now, Michael Howard, uh, why would anybody want to bring you back into government? Because we will take action on the things which matter to the country and the things which matter to people. And that's why we've been spelling out our plans to bring to this country uh, school discipline, clean hospitals, more police, controlled immigration, lower taxes, the things that really people do care about and the things that are important for the country's future. And unlike Mr Blair, who talks a lot but does very little, we will carry out the promises we make. But we know what you're like in government. You were the man who brought us the poll tax. You were part of the cabinet that presided over that embarrassing fiasco with the ERM. Mm. Well, let's, let's talk about those things. The ERM was indeed a terrible mistake. When we went into the ERM, we were supported by the Labour Party, the Liberals, the uh, TUC, the CBI, it, and we are the only party about, that's learned our lesson. It's no, about no, no, let judgment, me, just, just Mr Howard. Indeed it is. It is about judgment. We are the only party that's learned our lesson from that. We're the only party that isn't going to take the country into the euro, right. which is the ERM writ large, with no exit signs. Um, we all know what Blairism is. We knew what Thatcherism was. What is Howardism? Howardism, if, if you want to use that word, is a, a practical programme for dealing with the challenges facing this country, for changing the direction of the country, and for putting in place things which really matter to ordinary people in their lives. That's why, for example, um, we're, we're talking today about crime. Crime's gone up, crime's out of control. People need a government that's going to get a grip on the problems facing the country, and we're spelling out exactly how we're going to do that. No one denies, of course, we need a government uh, that would get a grip on the country's uh, problems. But as you've already conceded, it is a matter of judgment. And you've been wrong on so many issues, haven't you? Well, I've been, uh, I've been right on very many issues. Well, let's, I, uh, I let's, mean, let's talk about... If you, you want to talk about the past, I'm very happy to do so. Well, I mean, when I was Home Secretary, you're... crime fell by 18%. It hadn't happened before, ever. It hasn't happened since. So I've proved that I can get a job done. And that's what we will do. That's one of the ways in which we'll be different. We you oppose the we national went, minimum we, wage. We you said just, it would cost two we, million well, jobs. We it hasn't, just, has it? We, we won't just talk about things. You, we won't start things and not finish them. We won't you, pussyfoot about. We'll actually do the things we're promising. You oppose the extension of paid maternity leave from six weeks to 14 weeks. You said it would cost many, many women's jobs. It hasn't. You see, that's just two examples. And we've learned To say lessons. nothing of the poll tax, um, well, to say nothing of the ERM. Well, well, we've talked about the ERM. We're the only party to have learned our lesson from that. We'll I'll tell you about the poll tax, if what you like. What did Major get wrong uh, apart from the ERM? The, the ERM was, was the biggest mistake that government made. And we were in government, although everybody else supported that decision. Yeah. You're, 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 you're right to say we were in government. We have to accept the responsibility for but, that. And but we, apart and, from and the ERM, and, 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 and Major did. government basically was but, right, was it? I think we did. We did a lot of very good things. So if we vote but, for you, we get what major part two? No. If you vote for the Conservatives at this election, you get a government that will take action on the challenges that face the country and on the things that really matter to people. And I give you one example: crime. Let me give you another example: clean hospitals. Five thousand people a year die in our country from hospital-acquired infections. As many people as die on Britain's roads. We have an action yeah. plan which will deal with that problem, which will bring it under control. There's no reason why in this country of ours we should have that problem worse than it is in almost any other country in Europe. What proportion of the national income do you think should be taken up with government spending? We've said that by 2011 government spending will be 40% of national income Le under Labour it will be 42% of you see, national income. that's another income. area we've, in which you've changed, we've, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, you I used have, to say 35%, didn't yes, you? Yes, I have changed my mind. I think it's important to learn lessons uh, as life so, goes on and to look at well, things again. And, I, 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 and that's right. We so if you've been wrong on all these things that. in the past, 
we don't have the slightest guarantee you'll be right on anything in the future. Well, you know, we can we can talk about the past. You can about the time that uh, that, that I brought in the Poe tax. Tony Blair was a member of CND. He was opposing all the reforms to the trade unions that we brought in. He was uh, he was describing our plans to give trade union well, members the right to vote for their see. leaders as scandalous. So we can argue about the past to your heart's content. I think most people watching this program are interested in our plans for the future of our country. Absolutely. Well, let's look at tax then. Very good. Are you going to cut taxes? Yes, we're going to cut taxes by £4 billion in our first budget. That's a guarantee, is it? That's a guarantee. You are guaranteeing £4 billion. We worth. are guaranteeing £4 billion. Although, overall, on your watch, taxes would go up. Well, it depends whether you're talking about tax rates or the tax burden. No. Both the will burden be, of both tax will go up by, what, about £20 billion? Pounds? Well, it will be lower under the Conservatives and it will be under Labour, yes, but, but yes. But it will go up. Yes, yes, because that's what happens. There so are three... That, that question you, shows, General, let me deal with this, it's very important. That question shows that you understand three things about what a Conservative government will bring about. First of all, we'll bring about a growing economy because the tax burden goes up and, and, it and shows a growing we economy. Understand that you it, will shows that, it shows that we understand... Taxes. It shows That's that we... All. No, 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 no. We, you, we're going to cut taxes. The tax burden goes up when, a, when an economy right, you, grows. You talk about 66, is it? 66 Labour self 66 tax, tax rises. You're going to remove all of those, are you? No, we're going to cut taxes right. by four billion pounds in our first budget. I wish that we could undo all the damage which Labour have done in the last eight years at one uh, fell swoop. We can't do that. We, c we are only making promises we know we can keep. That's why we will cut taxes by four billion pounds in our first budget. Will you guarantee to reverse the rise in national insurance contributions? No. I'm not making any promises that I can't keep. There are lots of things I'd like to do, lots of things I'd love to do. But, but In fact, the, you the, could what, increase what we can national do, insurance contributions, couldn't you? Well, l l let me deal with that. I'm, I can tell you, as I just have done, with certainty, what we're going to do in our first budget. And we're going to cut taxes by £4 billion in our first budget. Labour, by contrast, all the independent commentators say, will have to increase taxes by £10 or £11 billion. But if you're asking me, what, I'm, what, what I, I'll be able to do three or four years out, then in truth, although we've spelled out our plans, although our plans certainly don't need us to increase taxes at all, I can't foresee exactly what the position's mm. going to be in three or four years' time. Uh, uh, there may be unforeseen so events. raise national insurance. Our plans don't require us to do that. But I can't sit here that today... That is exactly what Blair said before the last election. Uh, and they increased national insurance one year later. Precisely. We were, they weren't talking about three or four years on. Now, I'm telling you what we're going to do in our first budget. So three or four years out, you might raise it. I can't tell you what the position is going to be three or four years. You, you may have foresight. You may, you may no, be able I'm to not. predict, Jeremy, with great precision what's going to happen in three or four years' time. Now, let me explain. We've spelled out our plans. We've set out our spending plans for the next six years. If no unforeseen events occur, we will be able to deliver that spending without increasing taxes. But I can't put my hand on my heart and say that I can predict exactly what's going to happen over the next three or four years. And if some extraordinary unforeseen event occurs, then I can't say what we would have to do as a responsible government to deal with that. But I'm making a very firm promise, which we will keep, about what we'll do in our first budget, we'll cut taxes by four billion pounds, Labour will increase taxes by 10 or 11 billion pounds, they'll have to. That's the clear choice facing the country at this election. What are the current services provided by the state that you think the state shouldn't provide? Well, there are things which the state does at the moment which we think it doesn't do well and which we think we can do better in a different way. Now, there so are the, what should be taken out of right. the state well, we're going, As you know, we're going to abolish things like the regional health authorities. We don't think they add anything. We don't think they, they bring any money to the front line. So we will save a very substantial amount of money by cutting out the regional health authorities. We'll scrap the regional assemblies. We think they are a completely unnecessary layer of bureaucracy. We'll scrap the New Deal. That's a tough decision. That's something which we think is not working well. We think there are better ways of getting people back into work than the New Deal. So we're going to scrap that. We're going to scrap the small business services. Um, most people I meet who run small businesses have never heard of the small business service. They don't think it's helping them much. So those are examples 
of things we are going to scrap in order to give taxpayers value for money. Some of them are quite tough choices, but government is about tough choices, but not just about talking about tough choices, it's about making tough choices. Let's that's look, what we'll do. Let's look at the health service. You seek a greater role for the private sector in the health service, correct? Well, we think that we think two things about the health service. We, we think first, first of all, we think that everybody should have more choice. That means that any NHS patient should have the choice of going to any NHS hospital. Secondly, we think that if the private sector can provide health care at the same cost as the NHS, then it should have the right to supply those services and patients should have the right to go to the private sector for those services. And thirdly, we think that uh, People have paid their taxes, they've paid for the cost of their NHS treatment. If they choose to go private, the NHS should pay half of what it would have cost the NHS to, uh, to pay for those operations uh, towards the cost of their treatment right. in the private sector. Right, and that uh, latter proposal takes £1.2 billion out of the health service and straight into the private sector. Well, these are people who've paid yes their no. taxes. It does, yeah, doesn't yes, it? Well, yes, it, it does. It, it, it takes one point two billion being, it's straight being spent out of the, national, the publicly funded national health service and put into the private sector. It's being spent on people's health care. This present yeah. government is spending hundreds of millions of pounds in the private sector. But the short I believe, answer to the question is yes, it yes, is. Yes, I believe that if people have paid their taxes, have paid towards the cost of their NHS treatment, but find for whatever reason that they have to or want to go private, they it's should right be subsidised by the state to do so. It's right and fair for the NHS to pay a cost. Look, these people could have cluttered up the NHS waiting list. That would have added to the it NHS waiting list. If they choose to go private for half the cost to the NHS, they're allowing someone else to come up the waiting list, get their operation sooner. They're, they're saving the NHS money because the NHS so is only contributing half of what it would have cost If you're rich enough to have private health NHS, insurance, you propose that the state should then make it easier for you to go privately. 200, Correct. 220, Correct yeah, but let me, let me explain Thank something you. to you. 220,000 people last year without well. any health insurance, people who were not by any stretch of the imagination mm. rich, people who in many cases had to borrow, and which they could ill afford to do to pay for their operation, went into the private sector. They've paid their taxes, they've paid towards the cost of NHS treatment. Uh, I think they deserve a better deal. That's Howardism, isn't it? You can call it what you like. I think it's fair play. I think it's common sense, and I think it's fair play. These people have all paid their taxes. They've paid towards the NHS. Uh, I think it's right that if they uh, shorten the waiting lists on the NHS, if they enable the NHS to treat someone else, it's right that the NHS should pay a proportion of what it would have cost the NHS to treat them. Well, by I that let, principle, someone... the state should pay parents who want to send their children to private schools. Well, we... Only if the private school can, 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 can provide the oh. education at the same cost as the state sector can. Well, any, anything else you want to privatise? But neither of those things are privatisation. These You're taking are, money these, straight out of the public th th sector are, into the private sector. These are, these are things which will give people in this country a better deal. They involve fair play for people who've paid their taxes, who've paid for the cost of their NHS operations, who've paid for the cost of their education. For heaven's sake, who happen to if be they able private, to afford private if they, insurance. If they private, if they, no, many of them can't afford private insurance. I'm, I was with someone in Bolton a couple of days ago who'd had to pay, borrow £8,000 to get an operation which he couldn't get on the health service. He, could, he was not rich by any stretch of the imagination. That's the sort of thing that is happening today. And for heaven's sake, if the private sector can come up with education at the same level as, as the state sector, why shouldn't someone be able okay. to choose uh, that private, Apart private from sector the health school? Se the health sector and now education, any other areas you think that should be a greater role for the private sector in? I, I don't approach these things as a matter of ideology or dogma. If if I'm persuaded, I'm not, if I'm persuaded that I'm there not are, I'm asking why you do it. I'm, I'm asking answering whether, your question. whether you think there are other areas. And I'm answering that question. If if I am persuaded that there are areas where the private sector can deliver a better service for people in this country than the state can, I'm in favour of it. I'm not, I'm not oh, really? wedded to any ideology. What to I'm any interested ideology. in... Well, what presumably I'm, you wouldn't privatise the armed forces, what, what, would you? No, I wouldn't, because I think the private sector couldn't do that job. I want people to get the best deal they can in this country, everyone in this country, and if they can get it from the private sector rather than the state, then I think they should be allowed to. 
All I'm interested in is getting the best deal for the people of Britain. And I think if you ask people what they're interested in, they'll tell you they want the best service they can get. They want the best health care they can right. get. They want the best education for their kids. That's but what they're interested in. And they're not fussed uh, about where it comes from. They want it to be free, quite rightly, and so do I. Let's look at immigration. Hmm. That's another area in which you've uh, changed. You're proposing a total limit on immigrants to this country, including asylum seekers. What's the number? We haven't got a number yet. That's what because do you mean we you haven't got a number. Uh, I'm you're just asking, about, you're I'm asking just about us to, to tell you. You're asking us I, to I'm make you a government you. next month. Yes, and I'm just about to tell you why. Because we will ask Parliament every year to set a limit on the number of people who can come into this country. What is your Parliament, recommendation for the parliamentary well, limit for 2005? Uh, just let me finish the answer, Jeremy. Parliament will set the limit after there's been consultation. There will have to be consultation with the CBI and other employers' organisations so that we can get the right number of people coming into this country uh, with skills which we need as economic migrants. We will set a number for family reunion and we'll set a number for genuine refugees. And in that way we will arrive at the annual limit. And let me tell you about limits because there are people who think this is a, an outrageous no, no, idea. Let's not go on to the principle of it. Just, well, just, why not, not get on to the principle of it? I'm going to get on to the principle of it. It's the principle oh, yes. of it that's important. We'll deal with the principle. The Don't you worry. It's the principle of it that's the difference between us you and Mr Blair. You say there's going to be a numerical limit. You say you don't know what that limit will be. And I'm yet you said, did you not, in an advertisement in the Sunday Telegraph a matter of a few weeks ago, it would be somewhere between 10 and 20,000. No, no, that, that was for asylum seekers. That, oh, that, so for, in for addition genuine to that, refugees, we'd have, a, we'd have economic migrants refugees. in addition to that. Yes, of course you would. Of course we would. Well, the well, Prime Minister is quite able to tell us roughly what number of economic migrants we need. He's told by business, perhaps it's 130,000. Now, if business come to you and say, we need 100,000, 200,000 perhaps economic migrants a year, you would deny them, would you? Uh, we would talk to them. We wouldn't necessarily accept what they say. We would have a dialogue with them. That's what consultation means. We want to find out what I they you think. you were the party of business. Well, well, we want to find out what they think. We will talk to them. We will ask them to take into account when they're considering how many people you... are needed. Please let me finish. When, when, when we're asking them to consider how many people we need, we'd ask them to take into account the fact that there are millions of people you... in the new accession countries of the European Union who are entitled to come here. So, so bearing in mind that, uh, you look at what Ireland has done. Ireland, taking, taking into account uh, the, the, the number of people who can come here from Eastern Europe, has reduced the number of work permits it gives out from 50,000 a year to 2,500 a year. I think there may be lessons we can learn from Ireland on this. Have you not had that conversation yet? No. When we, Mr. When we Howard, you're asking, in, you are seriously telling us that in two weeks' time you could have been the victor in this election and you haven't even had this conversation on what you say is an absolutely critical matter of public policy. Of course not. We'll have the conversation when we're in government. We'll be, set, we'll be asking Parliament at some so point in the year to set a limit for 2006. And we will have ample time to consult the CBI and the Do you think that limit is going to be in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands? I think it will be less than the number of people who come into the country today, which is, which is about 150,000, which has gone up three times under Labour. It's tripled under Labour without anybody being consulted, so it's without anybody being less than 150,000, but what, more than 100,000? I can't give you a precise figure. Less than 150,000. We will Shouldn't consult... Shouldn't you have done a bit more homework on this? Not at all. The, the argument between us and Mr. Blair is the point of principle. Mr. Blair doesn't right. believe there should be any limits on immigration in this country. I do. That's the point of principle. That's what people will have to decide at the election. The real question of high principle here is the question of asylum seekers. The rest is a matter of economics and economic necessity, isn't it? No, on the question no, that, no, no, no. There's a principle about whether you should have a limit. It's a very important difference. Whether you're prepared between... to constrain the economy. No, no, I don't believe it would constrain the economy at okay. all for the reasons I've given. Let me, right. let, let's, let's, let's deal with this. Of, let's, let's look at the question of asylum seekers. No, 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 no. Let's that's deal the with one area you have no, 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 put a number on, I've come on, to that, it? but let's deal with this point of principle for just one more moment, because this is, this is the point on which we're being attacked. This is the difference. We say there should be a limit. Now, I have in my pocket a quotation from the patron saint of liberalism, Roy Jenkins. And this is what Roy Jenkins said about immigration. This is from Roy Jenkins. He said, there is a clear limit to the amount of immigration this country can absorb. Yeah. And it's in the interests of the minorities themselves to maintain a strict control. 
That's what I think. It's not what Mr. Blair thinks. That's the difference in principle between us. Let's look at this question of asylum, because you are prepared to talk numbers there, aren't you? We've given illustrative yeah, figures. Yeah, you say 10 to 20,000. We haven't decided, 10 to 20, but we, that's an illustrative figure, yes. And you have made great play of the fact that you yourself come from refugee stock. I come from immigrant stock, actually, uh, not refugee stock, if you want to be strictly accurate. I do come from immigrant stock. I thought I heard you say you came from refugee stock. No, you, you, no, that's not true. My father came to this country to do a job. He was an economic migrant, if you like. He was not, uh, he was not a but, refugee. But if you set the limit, let's say the upper limit, 20,000, and the 20,000 and first person to present themselves on the shores of this country is a, say, a white farmer from Zimbabwe who's been tortured by Mugabe's thugs, you're quite happy to turn around to him and say, I'm sorry, mate, don't unpack, no. go back. No, it wouldn't work like that. Let me, shall I explain to you how it would work? When we have a limit, we would phase, obviously, sensibly, the, the rate at which we would accept genuine refugees over the year. And we would aim to get the 20,000 in over the period of a year. So we would have the 20,000th, as, as you describe, uh, I suppose, arriving sometime in December. And if someone arrived, uh, someone wanted asylum in the circumstances that you've described, we would say, you'll have to wait a little while and we'll put you into next year's quota. It would work very simply uh, and very effectively. You'd have an enormous way. backlog, wouldn't you? I don't think so at all. Where, where would no. these people actually physically be? Well, what we'd like to, to work towards is, is the following system. At the moment, let's start with describing where we are at the moment. At the no, moment... No, 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 where would to, you put them? Where I'll, would they be? I'll, I'll come to it. Just let me, let, let me, let me tell you how, how we get to where we want to be. At the moment, we have a system that is desperately unfair and inhumane. The people who benefit from it are not genuine refugees. They are the people who no. pay the people smugglers to come to this Hang country. On, where genuine would refugees. you put these I'm, people? I'm going to explain that to you, Jeremy. You just have to be patient for a moment or two. Only two out of ten of the people who apply for asylum in this country today are genuine refugees. So we want to break the link between people who have to come to the country illegally, who have to trick their way in, in order to apply for asylum. We would take a number of genuine refugees from uh, the UNHCR, and if well, people arrived right. in this country and wanted I, to claim you've asylum... You've a minute we or would, two and you still haven't I'm told just, us, where, is this where are they going to be? That's because you keep interrupting. If you didn't interrupt, I'd have got there by now. Look, it's very but simple. Name those, a place. Yeah, if those people... If there are people who come into this country and to apply for asylum, we would look for overseas processing centres and put them there. Well, I'm in opposition. I can't negotiate with other governments. This is another thing you've not had a conversation about, is no, it? No, but it is when we'll get into government. And let you've me, not let had me the pull, conversation let, yet. Let, oh, we've got another me, piece of paper. We have got another pocket. piece of paper. Yes, we have Where got another piece of paper. Where these pieces of paper suddenly come from? Well, th this, is, this comes from number 10 Downing Street, as a matter of fact. It's from the Prime Minister. And this is what it says. It was a letter written to uh, the person who was in charge of the European Union at the time. It begins, Dear Costas, uh, and it continues, I'm writing to ask for a very short discussion at the Brussels European Council uh, of an idea we've been developing to help deal with the problem of refugees and migration. Yes. And it goes on to talk about that asylum seekers arriving in the UK and other EU member states could be transferred to a transit processing centre where right. their claims could be assessed. That centre would be located outside the EU. Now, the difference between Mr Blair and me is that he talks about things, but he doesn't do them. He starts things, but he doesn't finish them. He pussyfoots around. Right. He but had the idea himself, this... but we would put it into practice. Uh, well, you say that he sent um, a letter he inquiring did. about it. Yes, he did. But he just wanted to be clear the European about this, Union to do it. You have nowhere that has agreed. Of course board. not. I'm an, I'm an opposition you. leader. Also, but when we're in government, we'll negotiate. So Mr. A rather Blair, badly briefed opposition leader, Mr. apparently. Mr. Mr. Blair, Mr. Blair only does things like this if he can get the agreement well, of the whole of the European see, Union. See, I would do it as the see, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And this we'd do would it. also involve you, would it not, in withdrawing from the 1951 UN Convention on refugees. Yes. Um, are you aware of any other civilised country that has withdrawn? No. Are you um, aware of any other political party in Europe, even, for example, the extreme right-wing National Front Party in France advocating such a withdrawal? I, I have no idea what that... No. What that are you aware is. of the Mr. other countries which are not Mr. signatories Blair, to that, Mr. that convention? Blair are you on, aware of what they are? Mr Blair is on record as saying that the 1951 convention is out of date, 
and that it doesn't uh, respond to the circumstances well, which we face today. I agree with him about that. The difference between us is that he only talks about it. I'm prepared to take action to deal with it. You presumably have a list of paper on which you've got the names of the other countries which are not signatories to that convention. I, you know that they include, for example, Saudi Arabia, uh, Libya, North Korea. You want to be in the company of those places, do you? I'm interested in doing what's best for Britain. I'm interested in doing the right thing for the people of this country. I believe that we have to bring immigration under control, that we have to limit the circumstances in which people apply for asylum in this country, and if that means that we have to withdraw right. from the 1951 let Convention, that's what I do. OK, let me just be clear what it is you're afraid of. Are you seriously saying that unless some measure like yours is taken, there is a danger of something like race riots or something in this country? I am saying that we need to, to bring immigration under control and we need to limit it, just as Roy Jenkins said in the quotation that I've just put to you, because of the importance of good community relations in this country, because we need to have a proper grip on security, and because we need to manage effectively the demands on our public services, the demands on housing, and the demands on other things which are associated with immigration. At the moment, we yeah. have a number of people coming into the country the size of a city like Peterborough every year. Over the next few years, the government's own figures show that there will be five million more people coming into this country. The population will grow by five million because of immigration. That's five times the city of Birmingham. I think that although I recognize this is a country which has benefited from immigration, we are a better, stronger, richer country because we are more diverse. There have to be limits and there have to be controls. Two very quick points. Uh, firstly, on Europe. Are there any circumstances under which you would contemplate withdrawal from the European Union? No, I want to be a member of the European Union. Uh, that's, uh, that's very there clear. There are no circumstances I, at all. I believe that we do need to bring powers right. back from Brussels to Britain, but I want to remain a member, a member uh, of the European secondly, Union. And secondly, on the transatlantic alliance, what sort of a conservative leader is it who finds the gates to a Republican White House closed to them? The sort of conservative leader who's uh, not afraid to criticise the Prime Minister of his country when he thinks that those criticisms are justified. I've made criticisms of Mr Blair's conduct of the war yeah. in Iraq well, and, and I, I, I will carry on making those criticisms where justified and uh, you know if that offends certain people that's tough. So the, the choice at this election between you and Mr Blair is between a leader who supports a war and has sway in the White House and a leader who supported the war and has no sway in the White House. I would have a perfectly good working relationship with, with they President Bush. They won't even let you in through the door. Look, if I'm the Prime Minister of this country and, I, and, and President Bush needs to work with me, which he does, of course we'll work together. Of course we'll have a good working relationship. Britain and the United States have many things in common. Common interests, common values. And I would have a very effective working relationship with President Bush. What I'm not prepared to do is pull my punches in criticising Mr Blair because someone else wouldn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't like me to doing that. I'm going to do what I think is best for this country. I'm going to say what I think is best for this country. And frankly, no one is going to stop me doing what is best for the people of Britain. When you look at your campaign, immigration, private sector in the health service, talk of tax cuts and so on, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Well, I've no idea what you're thinking. I'm Jeremy. thinking it reminds me of William Hague, and we know what happened to him. Well, we've been talking about a range of issues, as you know. We have five commitments, uh, cleaner hospitals, school discipline, more police, controlled immigration, lower taxes. We've also been talking about pensions. We've been putting forward a miracle serious to proposals to deal with the problems facing the country and with the problems which people are interested in being dealt with. We will act to deal with those problems. That's why I'm actually very confident about the outcome of this election. Michael Howard, thank you. Thank you. Well, that was the last of our interviews with the three main party leaders. Their fate is in your hands now. Goodbye.